And uh, I was reminded uh, of Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Actually, verses 7 and 8. I'm just going to use this as a starting place. I'm not going to minister very long the word this morning because of the laying on of hands and the ordination uh, that is to follow. And thankful to be a part of that. But in Hebrews chapter 13, verse 7 says, Remember them which have the rule over you, who have spoken unto you the word of God. Amen. Amen. Whose faith follow, considering the end of their conversation. And that word is actually translated lifestyle, uh, rather than just limited to what they say. And then verse 8 says, Jesus Christ, the same, yesterday, today, and forever. And what he's talking about there is time. Yesterday, today, and forever. You'll notice that God throughout the entire Word of God does things in threes. It's kind of interesting to me that He always does things in threes. But then it's Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And the threes just expand from there. Three feasts of Israel. The Old Testament uh, tabernacle, the outer court, the inner court, the most holy place. And it just goes on from there. So he says, yesterday, today, and forever. Three people on crosses at the same time when Jesus was crucified. One of them represented the past. you remember that? One represented the future. said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. The other said, I'll have nothing to do with you. So it was the past actually representing Israel and representing the church or the new birth that was to come or the new kingdom. And so he says, Jesus Christ the same and the word same in the Greek is the word autos, A-U-T-O-S. It simply means himself. If I myself write a book about myself, it's an autobiography. Don't worry, you'll never hear that, but you'll never be able to read it. But anyhow, so Jesus himself is what it actually means. Jesus Christ himself yesterday, today, and forever. And of course, once again, the two thieves representing the past and the past always says, why? Or how long? Or why did you do that? Or why didn't you do that? It's amazing how people look at things negatively. Have you ever gone to a store and said to this clerk, I bet you don't have one of these? Yeah. Is that a negative context? You want a special tool or a special part? Bet you hadn't got one of these. Well, why did you come to the store looking for one? So the negative side of that, the old, says how long, what if, why didn't you? But the future says, what if again? How shall it be looking forward to that which is to come? Keeping in mind that he is the same Jesus yesterday, today, and forever. Amen. Now we change, but he does not. God. Now in conjunction with that, uh, let me share this with you just briefly this morning. One of the greatest compliments that God ever paid Moses was when he said to Joshua, Moses, my servant, is dead. It was the changing of the guards. Now, thank God we didn't have to say that here. Yeah. Bill, my servant, is not dead. Amen. Glory Amen. to God. Yeah. <laughs> He's not even sick. Amen. Amen. <laughs> we had some friends that wrote a song years ago about uh, Blaine and Christine Bowman, they, they are out of Lebanon, Ohio. And Blaine wrote a song that said, God's not dead, he ain't even sick. <laughs> so God's not dead, he ain't even sick, amen? amen? Bill is not dead, he ain't even sick. Amen. But the greatest compliment God paid, paid Moses was, Moses, my servant is dead. That said it all. And so it, 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 it began then the changing of the guard are involved, the change that would take place all over Israel because they left the wilderness and went into the promised land. And so it was a progressive thing that actually took place. Now, there are some words in our English language that sometimes have multiple meanings. You, you can use, and we get things confused, you know, like, I love Nadine, but I love chocolate pie. <laughs> you, you see, and I'm using the same word for it there. Uh, and, and there's a lot of words we do that. I'm not going to go into all of that this morning, but sometimes these words have multiple purposes, and sometimes words are negative, and sometimes words are positive. Uh, and we say things sometimes that, that we don't necessarily mean. Uh, you know, I, I could just squeeze you to death. Well, if you 
squeeze me long enough and hard enough, uh, you'd squeeze me to death. I mean, it'd get me where I can't breathe, you know. Uh, things like that. We'll say it and, and not really. And then we always say, take care. If I took the care, I would be a raving maniac. Yeah. You would too. If you took the care of everything that came your way, amen? Right. I would be in a state hospital somewhere <laughs> locked down in solitary. You just, and, and we think it's a southern cultural thing to say, now y'all take care. You hear? You know, that's how I would say, y'all take care now, you hear? And I'm thinking, ooh, if I took the care of it, I would be crazy. You, know, you just can't take the care because the devil will throw so much stuff on you, you can't handle it. Amen? But we say things like that. And we'll say, never mind. When my daughter Andrea was small, for some reason she misunderstood the word. She thought when we said never mind, we said ever mind. And so she picked up on it from then on, and somebody would do something, and they would say, and then she would say, well, ever mind. And I thought, well, that's really what we'd like for you to do is ever mind, rather than never mind. And then we'll say to people, forget it. And you know what that means. And, and that comes up a lot in husband and wife relationships. Forget it. You know? And if you're the husband, you better not forget it. I mean, just... A word of wisdom here. Just, you better not forget it. Amen? And then people will say to you, we'll talk about this later. Don't you hate that? Yes. Well, let's just do it right now before I have a coronary. You know, let's just go ahead and get this thing out of the way right now. Amen? Don't leave me hanging out there. We'll talk about it later, you know? We used to tell the kids, wait till we get you home. And all of a sudden they wanted to get out a block from the house, you know? I don't want to go home, you know, <laughs> because of what's coming. And then we'll say, whatever, you know. You ever do that to somebody? Well, whatever. You know, do what you have to do. You know, that's the way we say things. There's another word that we say a lot, and, and we don't say it as much as we might could have, is the word nevertheless. Nevertheless. Now, that's an interesting word, isn't it? In the English vocabulary... There's a lot of words that change the entire meaning of a sentence or a conversation and even the outcome of a situation. And I'm going to show you that in just a moment. And a lot of it just hinges on that single word you find in the Bible that says, nevertheless. In the Old Testament, the Hebrew word means a ceasing, when they said nevertheless, a ceasing or an end or a finality. Something stops. Nevertheless, in the Hebrew, it stop. But in the Greek New Testament, the word nevertheless means, listen to this, to mark a transition to something new. Nevertheless. Brother Bill is retiring nevertheless. You see that? So it means something new uh, and, and also carries with it in today's modern English, something you could really simplify. It, it simply means in spite of in spite of, nevertheless, in spite of the fact, nevertheless, you see? So it's a transitional period. Now I'm going to give you some references on this. In, I'm not going to read all this. Numbers chapter 13, verses 23 through 33, there's 10 verses. Nevertheless, changed a positive to a negative with the children of Israel because of 12 spies. Remember that story? They spied out Canaan. They went in and looked it over. Two of them said we could take them. Ten said, nevertheless. Listen to this in verse 28 of Numbers 13. Nevertheless, the people be strong to dwell in the land, and the cities are walled and very great, and moreover we saw the children of Anka, A-N-A-K there, nevertheless, we just simply can't take it. And it was Caleb and who else that gave a good report? I forget now. Joshua, that's right. Caleb and Joshua gave the good report, and uh, they said, we can do it. And you realize, if you follow their lives, you'll just see how blessed they were because they heard from God. Amen. While ten people gave a negative report and said, nevertheless, the people be strong. And those people from Anka there, they're big and strong and mean and violent and we'd never make it. And they would overtake us is what they were saying. What they were saying. So, he says to them, nevertheless, it changed a positive to a negative. The attitude was, yes, there's plenty of promises in the land we spied out, but in spite of that, nevertheless, we came to an end, a ceasing, a finality, because it stopped what God wanted to do in Israel. 
The word nevertheless. Say nevertheless. Nevertheless. Interesting little word, isn't it? Nevertheless. Now, in Luke chapter 5, at the beginning of verses 1 through 11, is the story of Peter and the fishermen. You remember that story? They, had, uh, they were on the sea, uh, on the lake of Gennesaret, and they saw two ships standing by the lake, but the fishermen were going out of them and washing their nets. They'd already fished, caught nothing or whatever. He entered into one of the ships and prayed, and then he thrust out a little bit, and he taught the people. And when they left off, when he left off speaking, he said to Peter, watch out. Well, there's a whole message here. Watch out into the deep. Oh, yeah. Amen. Yeah. And let down your nets for a draught. Drag your net. Watch out of the deep. Let's go fishing, boys. Amen. So here's what he did. He said, Master, we've toiled all night and have taken nothing. I mean, you know, nothing means nothing. <laughs> <laughs> nothing is more discouraging than fishing all night and catching nothing. Amen. But listen to what he said. Nevertheless, yes. Yes. at thy word, I will let down the net. Nevertheless, at thy word, I will let down the net. He changed a negative to a positive when Jesus was on Simon Peter's boat. Now, you know, he was a fisherman by trade. He knew the waters. I don't even know if he knew the cycles of the moon. Now, that really affects fishing. But he knew all of that. And he had, he had no reason to do anything the Lord said to do other than, nevertheless, Amen. at thy word. And so they did. And you know the story? They, they caught so many. It broke the nets. They called the other ships to come in. You know, when you're obedient, it not only affects your life, but everybody around you. you yeah, right. It really does. And you'll see that in a household more especially. But it also happens in church. When you and I are obedient to the Word of God, what God says to do, and we follow through obedience, it not only blesses your life, but everyone around you. Everything you touch is blessed. Amen? Amen. Don't you like to live like that? Yes. Praise God. So when he said, nevertheless, in that Greek form, it marked a transition. He said, nevertheless, we've told all night, but nevertheless, at thy word I will let down the net. Yeah. Peter said, we have tasted failure, but in spite of it, yes. nevertheless, at your word we'll let down the net. And the catch was just overwhelming to them. And finally, one other, in Mark chapter 14... This is a story of Jesus uh, and, of course, his, his upcoming death and when he's having a conversation with the Lord. Uh, did any of you ever see that movie, The, the Passion of the Christ? Yes. yes. We saw that, um, I don't know how many times we, we saw it, and then I think we got a, got a video of it, and, uh, and you look at it, it, it's just amazing, just absolutely visualizing what really did take place. And I love it in the Garden of Gethsemane when Jesus, and I don't know where they got that green boa constrictor. That was a huge thing. And it just, yeah. it just reared its head up right there and all of a sudden, don't you love the sound it made when yeah. Jesus squished his head? Oh, yeah. Squunch, you know. Yeah. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> you know, fulfilling the promises from Genesis 3.15, praise God. He said he'll bruise his heel, but he's going to crush his head. Hallelujah. And that's exactly what he did. And you know, through life we have bruises on our heels. <coughs> and it just makes you limp from time to time. You ever had a stone bruise? Oh, They're yeah. painful little things, aren't they? But you keep walking and keep moving, yeah. nevertheless. Amen? So in Mark chapter 15, 14, verses 35 through 39, uh, Jesus went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour, there's your time, might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, yes. not what I will, but what thou wilt. And then, of course, the disciples, almost as usual, were asleep. <laughs> you know, it's, it's interesting when you look at that. It's such a critical time. But it was probably best that they were asleep because in the mind of God, the thing was already done. Mm -hmm. Nothing they could have done anyhow. And Jesus stood as a lamb slain from before the foundation of the world. Two scriptures on that. Revelation 13, 8 and 17, 8. And so Jesus said, nevertheless. And he knew what awaited him. 
the trial, the mockery, the beatings were brutal. The cross, there's no way that someone could be crucified and you think it's a, a mild affair. I mean, it's violent. Uh, it, it's death to be nailed to a cross and then hung up. And, and they were not gentle. The Roman soldiers were not gentle with Jesus. You know that. I mean, he was basically unrecognizable. He, uh, the Psalms talks about that, chapter 22. And so he knew all that was ahead of him. And yet what he did, he said to the Father, nevertheless. And, and first of all, he acknowledges God's omnipotence. He said, all things are possible with you. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Now listen to this. His nevertheless changed the dialogue or the situation and the whole world by becoming a point of total surrender and submission to the will of God. He accomplished the divine purposes and will of God because of the power of nevertheless. Say it again. Nevertheless. nevertheless. You and I enjoy the presence of the Holy Spirit because of the power of the nevertheless. You and I have come face to face with amazing grace yes. and forgiveness and the almighty power of God. Because of his obedience, and I'll say it this way, in spite of what I want, we can experience the grace and the mercy of God because Jesus said, nevertheless. Here's a final thought. The power of nevertheless has the ability to change things. Change us as individuals and change us as a church. You, you probably, Lighthouse, you probably have change coming. Pastor Mike cannot fill Pastor Bill's shoes Amen. and a wise man won't even try. Amen? Amen. Don't even try. Bill, my servant, has retired. Amen. It's another era. Yesterday, today, and forever. By the way, I didn't say this a moment ago. Yesterday was one of the, one of the people on the cross. Today was the now. Yeah. When is faith? How do we say it in Mississippi? Right now. Right now. Right now. Faith is what? Right now. R A T. Faith's right now. I'm telling you. You're going to have to believe right now. Amen. Faith's right now. Praise God. And then the future was the one that said, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And so the power of nevertheless has the ability to change everything. Change us as individuals and as a church. It change what you say, your conversation, the situation. It can change an entire city, a nation. God help us. Amen. Amen. Yes. In spite of, we can change. Amen. Amen. You and I hold in our hands and our hearts what makes the difference. Everybody say, nevertheless. 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 Amen. You'll think about that this week, won't you? Uh, yes. <laughs> well, nevertheless, in spite of all of this, we're moving forward in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Father, thank you that Jesus was obedient. Thank you that Caleb and Joshua were obedient. And for the promised land and all its victory. Thank you, Father, that Peter was obedient. And he said, Father, we've fished all night and caught nothing, but nevertheless, Jesus at your word. And thank you for great victory, for overcoming victory. And so, Father, today we re recommit ourselves to nevertheless, in spite of everything around us, the world's going to torment in a handbasket, Father. Everything is out of control, upside down, out of kelter. All the things that take place around us and even to us, Father, in the name of Jesus, we say in spite of that, nevertheless, at your word, we're going to continue forward. And we thank you for victory because it's sweet and enjoyable. It's pleasant to the mouth. In the name of Jesus, thank you for the Lighthouse Church and for 40 great years Amen. with Bill and Betty Tolls and their family. And now for a new era, we ask your blessings upon Mike and Cindy in the name of Jesus and upon the Lighthouse Church that it is still
a lighthouse in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. 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 Praise God. Brother Judy, I'm going to ask you if you will to stay up here with us. Okay. Mike and Cindy, if they will come and sit here. While they're getting in place, let, let her sit there, if you will. You sit right here. Did you sit over there? We need, we need you closer to us. Thank you. Yes. While we're getting set up, I'm, uh, Pat is going to share scripture with us. Now this scripture is for my consenting. Nevertheless, it also applies to every one of us. And it's in Isaiah 42, verses 5 through 8. It says, Thus saith the Lord God, that created the heavens and stretched them out, he that spread forth the earth and that which cometh out of it, <coughs> he that giveth breath unto the people upon it, Spirit to them that walk therein. I, the Lord, have called thee in righteousness and will hold thine hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people, for a light of the Gentiles, to open the blind eyes, to bring out the prisoners from the prison, and them that sit in darkness out of the prison house. I am the Lord. That is my name and my glory will I give to none other. Neither my praise to graven images. Behold, the former things are come to pass and new things do I declare. Amen. Praise God. Uh, you're wondering what this is. It's called a talit. It's the prayer cloth that Jesus and all Hebrews used in their prayer time. And when when it speaks of them being in their prayer closet, they would literally drape this around their head and shoulders. And when they pulled it over their head. That was their closet. That was their tent. And that's when they worshiped God and prayed to Him. I thought it was really appropriate that we should drape this around Mike and Cindy. Amen. They enter this as one. Yes. And so... I think it's highly, where is it, Michael? I think it's highly, extremely appropriate that they should have the covering over both of them. Amen. It is a difficult task that uh, they undertake. And, uh, I'm going to have to turn this one off, yeah, okay. It's a difficult task that they undertake, and no one knows that better than the three of us who are standing here. <coughs> They're going to need your prayer, your covering, more than ever in their lives. Both of them are seasoned ministers. Mike is pastored in, uh, in Colorado. He does not come here as a, as a rookie. He has, even since he's come here, he's assumed greater and greater responsibility in counseling and, and pastoring here at Lighthouse. But Brother Hughie 
said to him yesterday afternoon, um, I'll paraphrase it, that the enemy is about to direct his wrath in a more extreme uh, battle against them than ever before. He has already in the last two to three years set himself to pull down Cindy and her health. We're here to declare to all of you and especially to the devil that that will not succeed. Amen. Amen. All his efforts will not stand. Yes. For greater is he who is in them Amen. than he who is in the world. Amen. And so we're going to proceed with the ordination. And I'm going to ask Brother Hudy if he will share some scripture. I've asked him, by the way, if he would uh, serve as the lead presbyter as we set him apart today, and he's he has uh, agreed to do that. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Amen. Right here. Yeah, we'll put your Bible right here. Okay. You'll some notes here just for a second. I want to share with you uh, several scriptures. One in the Old Testament, first of all, 1 Samuel chapter 16. And um, let me just read the highlights of it, if I may, to you. Um, because this is where David actually was anointed king of Israel, even though he was just a small boy, uh, or a young man, I should say. But in 1 Samuel chapter 16, uh, let me read this to you. And I did mark it and didn't go back to the mark. Here we go. In, in, Sam, in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verses 6 through 13, it came to pass when they were come that he looked out on Elam and said, Surely the Lord's anointed is before us. These are the sons of Jesse. And he had every son of Jesse pass before the prophet of God, Samuel. And, and then they looked at every one of them, and, and each one would come up and say, Surely this is the one. And so finally, Samuel said unto Jesse, verse 11, Are here all thy children? And he said, There remaineth yet the youngest. And behold, he keepeth the sheep. And Samuel said unto Jesse, Send and fetch him, for we will not sit down till he come hither. And he sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, and withal of a beautiful countenance, and goodly to look on. And the Lord said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. And that was David. And of course, we know the rest of that story. The history that goes with that. Now, in Titus, Paul is is actually uh, <clears throat> schooling or mentoring Titus. And in chapter 1 of the book of Titus, verses 5 through 9, he says, For this cause I, I, let, I left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city as I have appointed. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children not accused of riot or unruly. For a bishop must be blameless and the steward as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, and not given to filthy lucre, but a lover of hospitality, a lover of good men, sober, just, temperate, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he might be able by sound doctrine both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Those are representatives of the Old Testament and the new of an anointing or a setting aside of someone being appointed or of laying on of hands. Uh, Isaiah 52 verse 7 says, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him that bringeth good tidings, that publisheth peace, that bringeth good tidings of good, that publisheth salvation, that saith unto Zion, Thy God reigns. Now, without reading all of the scripture, in John chapter 15, Jesus said this, when he says, You have not chosen me, but I've chosen you and ordained you. The word ordained is actually not a New Testament word, but in the King James it's used, but it actually means to appoint or to be set in place or to be set. 
Yes. And that's the purpose of this today, is to set them aside. There's difference in ministry and the rest of the church. It's not an elite difference, but there's a calling. And the calling makes the difference. The calling to minister. It's, it's extremely unusual and very difficult to explain. Sometimes you can immediately recognize it, other times you don't. But it's there, that call of God to be set apart. And so the term, as it's originally used, simply means to ordain in the King James is better translated to a point. And Jesus saying, you've not chosen me, but I've chosen you and appointed you or placed you. And of course, in Acts chapter 14, uh, Paul and Barnabas appointed elders in the church with the laying on of hands or the lifting up of hands. There's numerous references to it. Acts chapter 6, Acts chapter 13, 1 Timothy chapter 4, and 2 Timothy chapter 6. And so it is this that we are here today in order to lay hands on and to set aside this couple for ministry in this church. Now, I'm going back to the Old Testament to pick up something that the priests did. And thank God for the priests in the Old Testament. Leviticus chapter 14. And, and I don't know, if, if you've not read Leviticus lately, you ought to read it. Because it deals with our lives and how to live. And God did not overlook anything. He covered all the bases, if I could say it that way. It's, and, it, it, and you say, well, that's under the law. No, 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 not all of it's under the law. It's just basic principles of living and things that God said don't do and things He said do. So it's interesting when you read that, but in the priests and their involvement in the book of Leviticus, the Levites, subsequently the name Leviticus, in chapter 14, verse 14, and the priest shall take some of the blood of the trespass offering, and that's another study for another time, and the priest shall put it upon the tip of the right ear of him that is to be cleansed, and upon the thumb of his right hand, and upon the great toe of his right foot. Now, here we come today. The blood has already been shed. Amen. There is no blood that we could bring to this event that would equal to the blood of Jesus or be superior to it. Amen. Go back and read Hebrews chapter 10. The blood of bulls and of goats didn't do it. No, it didn't. There's a better covenant. The blood of Jesus is far better. And so the blood's already been shed. The blood has actually already been applied. Yes. So now we come to the oil, which is the anointing. Yes. And the oil is always a representative of the Holy Ghost. Amen. I mean, if you've got oil, you're happy. Amen? Amen. And I'm not talking about black oil. It's just in the Old Testament, the oil would run dry. You remember that? And Elijah would pray over it. It never ran dry again. That made him happy. And so the oil is a type of gladness or the blessed Holy Spirit who brings the joy of the Lord into our lives as we serve Him. So he says in verse 15, And the priest shall take some of the log of oil and pour it in the palm of his own left hand. And the priest shall dip his right finger in the oil that is in his left hand and shall sprinkle of the oil with his finger seven times before the Lord. And the rest of the oil that is in the hand of the priest shall the priest put upon the tip of the right ear of him that is to be cleansed and upon the thumb of his right hand and upon the great toe of his right foot upon the blood of the trespass offering and the remnant of the oil that is in the priest's hands he shall pour upon the head of him that is to be cleansed and the priest shall make an atonement for him before the Lord. So this is what the priest did and this is what we're going to do. The law was a shadow of that which was to come. Always. The new covenant is our substance. Amen. Because it's done. Jesus did for us once again what we could not do for ourselves. And so the priest takes the oil and puts it on the ear, the right earlobe of the person that is cleansed or that is being set aside or being set in or appointed or anointed on the right earlobe. Now, I discovered this and I wish I knew when. I have used this for 20 years for baby dedication. We put all on their right earlobe, their right thumb, and their right big toe, and right in the middle of their forehead. Every baby I've dedicated, probably for the last maybe 25 years, we have done that to seal them into the kingdom of God. Amen. And at the same time, take authority over violent and bloody men coming by them, and just sanctify them in the name of Jesus under His blood with the oil of the Holy Ghost. And so it's appropriate to do this today to set in Pastor Mike. 
Now the right ear and the right thumb and the right toe is used because Ecclesiastes verse chapter 10 verse 2 says a wise man's heart leans to the right a fool's heart leans to the left. <laughs> I'll let you take that wherever you want to. Amen? <laughs> Praise God. Wise people lean to the right. Somebody say amen. amen. Praise God. And so the ear represents what we hear. And what you hear is what you will do. Uh, actually, because what, what you hear is what you see. Let me say it that way. What you hear is what you see. Apple. What did you see? Apple. How many of you saw a watermelon? <laughs> Didn't think so. There you go. Lemon. There you go. If I tell you that I just cut it and squeezed it, mm. Pat just did it. Mm. You see, not only do you hear it, but you see it to a point it affects you. Yes. We just talk about squeezing up a lemon. Amen. Just <laughs> now, uh, 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 can you taste it? <laughs> what you hear is what you see, and what you see is what you do. Amen. Now think about that. What you hear is what you see, and what you see is what you do. Twice Jesus admonished us. Luke eight eighteen. He said, "Take heed." what you hear. Mark 4, 24, take heed how you hear. I might have reversed those two. One of them says what you hear, one of them says how. But it gets the point across. Take heed what you hear and take heed how you hear. Saints, how many of you know that your head is not a garbage can? Thank you. Amen. 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 If it is, the trash man never picks it up. <laughs> Amen. Don't let people just bombard you with stuff that's not of God. Right, and every now and then you say, well, don't, you don't want to be rude. Well, be rude sometimes. Yes. I don't want to hear that faithless stuff. Amen. You know, don't say that. Just move on with it. Amen? Amen? Take heed what you hear and take heed how you hear. Amen. So I'm going to take some of the oil that we have here and I'm going to put just a little bit on my finger. Can I set that right there? It'll stay, I think. I'm going to take just a little bit on my finger and I'm going to put it on the right earlobe of Pastor Mike. Just touch it right here in Jesus' name. Praise God, brother. This is what you, what you hear with what you see and what you do in the name of Jesus. And so we anoint your hearing that you can hear from God. One of the most important things for a pastor is to be able to hear from God. Amen. Now, he's going to hear from y'all. Unsolicited most of the time. I told him yesterday, I said, whatever you do, whatever happens, good or bad, you're responsible for it. If it turns out good, they probably say, oh, thanks. If it's bad, you'll hear it for two weeks. Amen? You ever notice when pie is good, it's just good? If it's bad, the crust is flaky. Too runny. The meringue slid off. I'm, you understand know what I'm saying? You can describe something bad from here to next Sunday. It's good. You say, oh, that was good. Oh, that, that, was, that was good. You know, amen. That was good. So when it's good, y'all are just going to say, that was good. When it's bad, oh, Lord, have mercy. <laughs> be right. gentle with him. Amen. amen. <laughs> Some of you are old pros amen. at this. Just be gentle with him. Amen. Yeah. So what you hear, be anointed, and then you hear from God. Yes. So you know what to do, how to do it, mm -hmm. when to do it, amen. and with whom to do it. Yes. 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 Amen. Yes. What to do, amen. when to do it, yes. how to do it, amen. and with whom. Amen. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Brother Hudy dealt with the ear. And the second uh, place that the oil was placed was on the, the thumb of the right hand. And uh, I think it's really significant that everything was to the right. And that's where Jesus is. Yes. He's at the right hand of the Father. The right, right hand is the place of authority. 
When he sits at the right hand of God, he is in the place of authority. The hand, the thumb, the thumb specifically, represents authority. It represents also the work of your hands. And so it's fitting to anoint his right thumb for the work that lies ahead of him. Uh, he has been designated by the Holy Ghost to be the worker of the vineyard called Lighthouse. And he will work hard and diligently for your sake but most especially for the Lord's sake. And I am confident that he will labor long, hard, and faithfully. And his wife will stand by him and be with him through it all. But that right thumb illustrates and, and indicates his work, the work of his hands, to be faithful to work in the vineyard of God. And I... I have some scriptures I want to read in relationship to that and then I'm going to anoint his right thumb. In the 24th chapter of Psalm, beginning in the first verse, it says, The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the sea and established it upon the waters. Who may ascend into the hill of the Lord? Or who may stand in His holy place? And here's the answer. He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul to an idol nor sworn deceitfully, he shall receive blessing from the Lord. Then, uh, In 1 John chapter 1, verse 1, that which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and listen to this, our hands have handled concerning the word of life. The life was manifested and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. Then I'm going to read the scripture. This is a, a scripture that Paul was speaking to his spiritual son, Timotheus. We know him as Timothy. And uh, I know Mike is not of an age that he could be my natural son. But he is, in my opinion, in my estimation, my spiritual son. Amen to that. We have, we have had the pleasure of seeing him and Cindy through a, a great portion of their lives. And this is what Paul said to his son, Timothy. I'm going to take the liberty of substituting a word in it. Timothy was an evangelist. Brother Mike is a pastor. I charge you therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ who will judge the living and the dead at His appearing in His kingdom. Preach the word. Be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and teaching. You be watchful in all things. Endure afflictions. Do the work of a pastor. 
and fulfill your ministry. restored to her Amen. and she will stand alongside you Amen. as you work in the work of the Lord yes. here at Lighthouse yes. Church. Yes. Amen. God bless you. fellowship one with another and the blood of Jesus Christ his son cleanses us from all sin and Romans 6 4 says therefore and when you see the word therefore look see what it's there for Amen. we are buried with him by baptism into death that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the father even so, we also walk in newness of life. In Isaiah 40, 30, 40 verse 31, it says, But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up the wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary, and they shall walk and not faint. If you understand the, the anatomy of the Bible, you understand that the right toe or the, the big toe on our feet are for balance. If you've ever met anybody that's lost a big toe, you'll find that they're very awkward at times in their balance. God's given us that for a purpose. And Mike, my prayer is for you that God give you extraordinary balance in your life and in your yes. walk. He would send you yes. both. That He use you to bring about restoration in the body of Christ that those that don't know Him can come to know Him. That His heart's desire and purpose and drive will be always to get the Gospel to those that don't know Christ. Because as we look out among us and the people we meet daily, every person that you meet on the street is a potential person headed for hell. And it's our job to bring a right about restoration the Bible says that God has given to every man and woman the ministry of reconciliation. It's our job to walk in balance, but to share the Word of God with others to reveal the light of Jesus to them. Everlasting doors and the King of glory 
shall come in. So he says it twice. And one other scripture that Paul said in Philippians chapter 4, he says this, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, and whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, or any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. And then he clarifies it. He says, these things that you're thinking on, which you have both learned and received and heard and seen in me do, and the God of peace shall be with you. One other thought. Once again, Jesus did for us what we could, what we could not do for ourselves. The crown of thorns on his head represents our minds being renewed. Amen. His hands is our work. His feet, our walk. His back, our healing. By His stripes we are healed. And His side represents our spirit, represents the Holy Spirit, praise God. And so I'm going to put a, a drop of oil on your forehead. Yeah, all three of us here. That's great. Praise God. Thank you. Okay. Anoint your head. In the name of Jesus, praise God. Amen. Praise God. And I'm going to put a drop on Cindy as well. In Jesus' name, praise, praise God. God. Amen. Jesus. Thank you, Father, in the name of Jesus. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you, sir. Thank you for the blood and the oil. Thank you in Jesus' name for the anointing, the setting in in Jesus' name. Father, we speak a blessing on Mike and Cindy in the name of Jesus. And ask for their blessings upon, blessings upon them from the top of their head to the bottom of their feet. In Jesus' name. We speak total and complete healing to Cindy in the name of Jesus. We command the devil in Jesus' name to take his hand off of her regarding sickness or disease or malformity or anything, Father, that would deter her in the name of Jesus, her living a normal, healthy life. We speak healing to her right now in Jesus' name. And to Mike in the name of Jesus for the blessings of God, for his ear, his thumb, and his feet and his head that he'll walk with you all the days of his life. And Father, I thank you, and I believe I received a word that you're being set in for a season. And I don't know how long a season is, saints. I really don't. It could be whatever. But a season that the Lord is setting him in here at the lighthouse. I did tell him he didn't have 40 years. I don't think any of us have 40 years. That'd be 102. Yeah, well, praise God. I'm probably place there. But I believe God's setting you in for a season and I bless you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. amen. I believe it's appropriate to, to charge Pastor Mike with a charge that God would give to him. So I'm asking him this question. Do you promise to walk worthily of a vocation to which you're called, seeking always to bring honor to the name of Jesus Christ as your Lord? Do you promise diligently and faithfully to perform the duties of a minister of the gospel with no thought of personal reward or honor? having as your primary motives the winning of persons to Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord, and the building up of the Church of Christ through inspiration, teaching, exhortation, and stewardship to the glory of God. Do you so promise? Thank you, Jesus. Then I have, I believe, the mind of Christ to challenge, place a challenge before this church. The challenge has gone out to Mike and to Cindy. Now it comes to the church, to the body. Listen to what I'm saying, and I'm going to ask for a response. Do you, the members of the church, acknowledge and approve Pastor Mike, 
as a minister of the church of Jesus Christ? And will you pray for him in his ministry and work together with him to accomplish the mission of the church, giving him all due honor and support in his leadership to which the Lord God himself has called him? to the glory and honor of God. If you will signify your assent, assent, please raise your hand. Bless you, Lord Jesus. Praise God. We're going to have a closing prayer. And then we're going to give you an opportunity to come and embrace them, and encourage them, and just extend a hand of Christian fellowship toward them. Um, first, I think, uh, Pat, Brother Hughie, yes, would you all come and let's yeah. Yeah. present this, this is a certificate of ordination. Pastor Mike has been ordained long ago, but we felt it would be appropriate to ordain him again. This one is so fresh off the press that we have not signed it yet. <laughs> but I assure you we will sign it. Let's pray together. My God, my God. Amen. What a blessing it is, Lord, to realize that this is not just a marathon race. But Lord God, it is a marathon relay race where we run the race as Paul said he had run it. Then we pass the baton. Father, it's with a great deal of pleasure that I pass the baton of pastorship over this work, believing with all of my heart that we are on the cusp <coughs> of a major breakthrough and a major increase and growth in this church, not only in numbers of people, but outreach. And Lord, the hands that have grown weary pass with great pleasure. Pass the torch. Pass the baton onto these capable hands. And I thank you, Almighty God, for the honor and privilege of having pastored your people all these years. Now, Lord, with the anticipation of the years that to come that will be greater than the former. And we, we thank you for it, Lord. Grant it that all of us would, would place ourselves in a place where we can become a part of the team that pulls in unity this Lighthouse Church into the next era of ministry. In the sweet, precious, holy name of Jesus, I pray this prayer. And I'm going to ask you. Uh, I'm on. I'm. I'm going to uh, allow us three to be the first. Yes. <clears throat> Excuse me. But uh, the hand of fellowship, support. And uh, hug around the neck. Amen. And uh, we encourage all of you to come, make your way through it, and go back to your seat. When we've done that, we'll be dismissed. Amen. Praise God. Amen. Amen. Yes.